Hi guys, you all can hear me right? There was some new problem today. Oh. Oh, finally. Yeah, it seems I'm online. I I started live stream from from this stream and it the other one I cancelled in the evening that one got started. I was visible from there. So that's why I got uh, a little confused here. Yeah, this is not getting cancelled. The power is here for now. Even though we don't have electricity to run the run the state basically, and I think I know why the the power cut is happening. Uh, there are pro- pos- two possible reasons. One is that there's so much election campaigning going on that people are uh, hooking the lines and and setting up meeting spots and speakers and here and there. Probably that's why. Or because all of a sudden everyone has started turning on their fans and ACs, which we didn't need to until a few days back. Therefore, maybe it's not being the the uh, the electricity board is not being able to take so much pressure of so much demands of uh, humanity, all the all the fascist demands we have from from society like getting good AC and uh, and electricity at 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 affordable rates. Of course, the excuse is that uh, see the there are two uh, two basically electric supplies in the state. One is uh, uh the one that supplies electricity in the core calcutta area that csc that's just one private company run by the goenkas who don't face any any market competition and therefore can can ask for any money you want and therefore commies who did the deal with them use that as an excuse to bash capitalism that see this is what happens when privatization happens conversely in the west bengal state electricity, electricity department uh the prices are so low that the state can't even co- afford to basically keep keep up these prices but their excuses at least it's affordable for the poor people these uh, i i i'm not giving too much gali these days so i'll avoid that as much as possible even today they don't understand that it people who can afford should be able to afford but the, in return they should get at least the uh, the ever running electricity supply and it does not matter if i and a rickshaw puller use the same electricity at the same price because the elect- the rickshaw puller who is obviously poorer will have different gadgets he won't have a super power uh, computer doing live streams and and a ring light etc he probably has one fan and one tv okay so he he's he's going to pay less anyway and if he can afford that price he will much rather appreciate appreciate if the power is there now imagine imagine the condition of the rickshaw puller who goes to rest in his house has the affordable uh, uh, price for electricity and his fan isn't even working what a great nice e- equality of outcome for for the rickshaw puller and myself okay egi bangla yes in telugu language anna um, comrade no problem that's ha- that happens sometimes yeah thank you guys so today Uh, Sanjeev Sanyal has pissed off a lot of people in Trinamool Congress as well. Uh, already in the last two three days, he pissed off a lot of IAS aspirants, IAS people, retired IAS. I was very surprised at Sanjay Dixit's uh, reaction, frankly, because uh, Sanjay Dixit has has openly criticized IAS bureaucracy vehemently, vehemently. Okay, he has criticized Sushant Sarin has criticized in front of him. Uh, Vijay Sardana criticizes. So these people who who are friends with these people, even they criticize while be, while being in that same ecosystem. So I have been very respectful of these guys. That wow, they are coming from that that scene, scene and then even then uh, criticizing what where it's necessary. Okay, now I think yesterday Sanjay Dixit got angry and was basically showing his jati solidarity in this case. That no no no. i can i can criticize my jati who which is being an is but you can't because you are an out group because you are sanjeev sanyal and he brought up that sanjeev sanyal's father was also an is did he think so of the, that the, the same things about his father as well but uh, that, that's the same like uh, bengalis might say that yeah the the state has really gone to dogs etc but if it's a gujarati prime minister saying that or it's a gujarat finance phd saying it on youtube then 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 all hell breaks loose so basically it does not matter what the facts are it matters who says those facts that's the problem with sanjeev sanyal and then sanjeev sanyal also uh, ended up saying that uh, he 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 mentioned mrinal sen in a passing manner whether he was criticizing his filmmaking style or the things he used to show in his films i'm not exactly clear on that i i don't have too much problem if he if he criticizes his filmmaking as well because uh, well 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 why can't you criticize a filmmaker okay as if you have to like everyone's filmmaking style as if as if comics really appreciate good filmmaking then then everyone would go make uh, kashmir files and and savarkar a b- even a bigger hit than they, than it is than it already is so let's start with sandeep sanyal's uh, appearance first on that guy who wears braces 
his podcast where he discusses UPSC Bengali society then we will check out Sanjeev Sanyal's appearance on print where he discusses UPSC maybe we will just go through a bit of the same points probably i haven't watched the print uh, interview then i will read out to you to you guys i'll be a story storyteller grandfather today and i will read out to you a short film uh, a, a short story written by sanjeev sanyal to get you in, into the mind of sanjeev sanyal and what he truly thinks of kolkata and why this is important because this guy is not a guy he is not a he is not someone born and brought up in 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 the in the bureaucrat buildings of or the residences of of delhi okay or mumbai or gujarat he is 100% born and bred in kolkata he studied up till class 10 in st xavier school 11 12 in st james then again did graduation from st xavier's college then went to delhi then was a global strategist for deutsche bank a road scholar in oxford now a very successful economic advisor to narendra modi nirmala sitaraman and people people who are probably not even qualified enough to be the germ in sanjeev sanyal's puke they are they are basically they are calling sanjeev sanyal amir jafar and there's one fallacy that uh, people in jadavpur university are famous for every time you criticize jadavpur university they say aage chance pe dekha which even the mysterious sociologist was talking about which means that first because you are not even qualified to get admit admission in in uh, in what uh, in in jadavpur university that's why you are you are venting out your frustration by criticizing jadavpur university that's what was being said by ias officers yesterday to sanjeev sanyal who are you your biggest achievement in in your life is is memorizing a, a, a million different bullshit uh, b- trivia okay rubinrath thakur ke daadi mein kitne sare baal the likho oh now you are a person who is going to run the country fuck you no no single is officer is more qualified than sanjeev sanyal morally or education wise or work experience wise okay but this story book is very important because the story is called intellectuals okay and sanjeev sanyal since he is from this class only and he knows all these people and he has to work with uh, many of these people therefore he does not men- mention them by name but you will get the hints you will get the scenario he is talking about one story is about delhi if we get time we will discuss that but the main story we are, we are going to discuss is about the kolkata intellectuals and we'll see uh, that whatever he is saying whatever we were saying with the mysterious sociologist just a few days back you all know that we were basically corroborating everything sanjeev sanyal said in in that podcast right let's start now and the excuse always is that y- you see uh, so many g- people get into ias to to serve the country etc okay uh, if you if, th- as if ias is the only way to serve your country you you prepared all that bullshit trivia to serve your country okay why can't you serve in any other way the the, the perks that come out of ias that that did not matter to you at all it, this is like saying that i want to teach i want to teach so hard that i am i'm i'm basically doing protests in the in the streets of kolkata for the last 8 years if you are qualified if you really want to teach and teach and teach why can't you teach anywhere else anywhere else why can't you have you, you can make a million bucks doing tuitions why do you want the government job only okay of course they should get it because our taxes are paid into they are qualified the corruption is a different matter but i'm asking the people themselves people who 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 give the who try to give the vibe that they are they are only qualified for that job and they are so qualified even morally their morals are everything here there's no perks associated with it i just want the government job to serve and serve and serve oh my fucking god no you are unqualified you are unqualified to do any other job where where competence would be for for first and foremost you would be kicked out on the first day okay compare sanjeev sanyal's job profile at, at as a global strategist at deutsche bank versus any single government servant okay is that even a comparison anyone who works in the private sector will will know what i'm talking about like that time from yeah and and if they say that yeah i love the power the comfort and the impact you can have and i really like my country as well 
make all these points then i don't have any problem with you but if if you just make it about morals and serving the country then then you are useless from kolkata and i can relate to it it's getting murdered in front of my eyes i am trying to rebuild a civilization i'm not building just an economy yeah. so building a highway and rebuilding the ayodhya temple are a part of the same agenda why do people elect jyoti basu for the socialist government people elect all kinds of people for all yeah. kinds of reasons yeah. question is why did they reelect him my view is why shouldn't indians be billionaires we are one sixth of the world's yeah. population one sixth of the world's billionaires should live in india i was recently in us in los angeles there's some it's called mont gandhi summit held by mont gandhi family which is a billionaire family so every slide had india at its forefront absolutely so that is a change we could have done this a generation ago maybe two generations yeah. ago but we didn't because our aspiration was ki hum garib rahe If you must dream, surely you should dream to be Elon Musk or Mukesh Ambani. Why did you dream to be Joint Secretary? Yeah, yeah. This is, I think, what pissed off Sanjay Dixit most because he used to be a Joint Secretary. But I, I still have as much respect for Sanjay Dixit as as I had until yesterday. But I think I hope he understands where Sanjeev Sanyal is coming from. As for the people who who defend IAS without any any criticism at all, then them I'm I'm not I'm not even addressing. Dream to be such an unbeliever in terms of Flipkart. I still think way too many young kids who have so much energy, etc., are wasting their time basically trying to crack the UPSC. Yes. If they put the same energy into doing something else, we would be winning more Olympic gold medals. We would be seeing better movies being made. We'd see better doctors, entrepreneurs, scientists, and so on. So I would say it's a it's a waste of time. This is an important point. This this point highlights that there has been a brain drain even inside the country. The biggest brains have gone to IAS. with the with the in the garb of serving the country but they of course wanted comfort and of course you should want comfort in your life of course you should seek job security but admit that that's all i'm saying and therefore maybe give some extra credit to people who are getting into jobs where there is no job security but the point is so brilliant that imagine a brain of vivek ramaswamy in an ias job no he he is much more effective in business in writing books and changing the country as a whole so the the brain quality has has gone in ias so sanjeev sanyal is not saying ias should be eliminated cut down all 75% of bureaucracy no one should uh, sh- pe- people should not do upsc etc he is tilting the narrative he is nudging the narrative in a very specific direction and imagine now when a person who was being let's say forced to prepare for a upsc but he wants to do something else shows this video to his parents that see mom Narendra Modi's chief economic advisor is also saying that no there are so many other great things to do in life other than UPSC especially because the country is poised to do, to do that the the stock markets are are absolutely raging on fire in, in in a good way and now if you do it you have 10 20 years to set up your your uh, whatever you venture you are planning to do other than UPSC and you you'll see great benefits the the country is at the best spot it has been in probably 1 1000 2000 years for a for a personal business and why shouldn't you do that okay that's the conversation sanjeev sanyal is nudging and i th- i believe it has 100% happened with the ashirwad of narendra modi narendra modi is known to be uh, let's say narendra modi did have plans to take on the ias okay he did not do it prashant kishore said it just a few days back that i i that was the reason he stopped working with narendra modi he he told to him that please please now now tweak uh, ias narendra modi said wait bhai ek do term jane do unko unko kaam karwane karwa lete hain pehle theek hai to uske baad hum isse chhed chhad karenge because narendra modi has patience prashant, prashant kishore did not did not have patience at the moment and he admitted that i did not have patience but i i should have understood it that's exactly what prashant kishore said we know narendra modi knows that and uh, narendra modi believes in these sorts of things and now you see maybe therefore these things are coming in the next term that's why he is using sanjeev sanyal to start the discourse about these things so, narendra modi knows that nothing can happen in the country without discourse and he is triggering that discourse on the backs of on the shoulders of sanjeev sanyal okay don't think this has happened without his go ahead this is sadhat alwalia welcome to the neon show sanjeev sanyal sir so good to have you back on the show it's a pleasure Thank you so much. Your first episode on Neon Show received tremendous response, almost at eight hundred thousand views on the main episode. Few shots have crossed one million each, and the audience wanted back you on the show. Thank you so much for coming back. I'm so glad that we could make it happen. It's a pleasure. So, would like to start with what are the different things that you're now part of? Right, it's been almost four five months since our last conversation. So, I mean, obviously, my day job, which is my primary activity, is uh, running the economy. Yeah. So, I, as you know, I'm an I'm a economic advisor to the prime minister, and so that takes up much of my time. um i also have an interest in uh, uh writing history books as you know so i have not written a book recently but i have do give lectures and so on and one of those books uh, revolutionaries has been converted into an look at look at his productivity he is saying i haven't written a book in a while 
do you know how in a while that is 7 to 8 months when did this book come out just just few months back not even one or two years back i think it's probably just one year back amazon prime uh, series so that is something on the side um i'm also trying to build by the way a wooden ship okay based on a 5th century uh, ad design yeah a little background on this he has he has spoken about this in the book land of seven rivers which turned me into a sanghi and uh, ocean of churn as well that there was a point in time when indians were the foremost ship builders in the world most advanced technology then we got complacent we got arrogant stopped advancing our technology chinese ended up uh, building better ships and then of course other technology came up so the technology we did when it was the best in the world was that we had stitched ships not one single solid body of wood or or multiple solid bodies what the the, the advantage with a with a stitched ship was that even when it hit hit a beach or or a few rocks in a storm it would not completely get demolished it would adjust to the shape where it is getting struck okay so he is trying to rebuild that and because of those stitched ships uh, our our merchants could go to the places they did uh, which is a gupta era design uh, of a ship uh, uh, from the indian ocean region uh, and it will be built on the original uh, sort of uh, uh, concept so uh, there will be no nails in it it will be stitched together and uh, it will have obviously all the sails and it will not even have a rudder it'll using a trailing oar and the idea is to build this which is being done in uh, goa as we speak and the next year when it comes on stream then uh, with the help of the navy i'm going to attempt to sail this first to oman and then to indonesia amazing we we'll look forward to it <laughs> so our audience loved our conversation about kolkata last time and they're all asking more details on it like okay guys i don't know if you all can see it here you see this leaf sort of a sculpture behind that is vikram sampath's savarkar book last time you mentioned the word kolkata didn't die it was murdered hmm. and the audience just laughed on it because hundreds of thousands of people from kolkata replied shared on comments that i am from kolkata or i have visited kolkata stayed in kolkata for 20 years and i can relate to it it's getting murdered in front of my eyes right so just want to go back to the history of it where it all started with maybe chief minister jyoti basu hmm. and in 1947 as you mentioned in the few interviews it was the largest hub the largest city across asia like after japan maybe So um yeah i mean when i was born as i mentioned kolkata was uh, even in 1970 it was india's biggest city it was the biggest commercial and industrial hub um it was culturally and politically a very vibrant place uh, indeed before independence it was even more important because it of course was a capital till uh, uh, 1912 actually effectively into the 1930s because even though the capital shifted it continued to be the main hub and it produced all these greats within a few generations i mean um vivekanand um uh, shri aurobindo Uh, Netaji, Rabindranath, Rabindranath Tagore, and by the way, many of these people knew each other very well. So it's uh, so it's within a uh, couple of generations, and this huge. And by the way, there were huge industries. Beng Bengalis, by the way, were famous as scientists, uh, uh, as businessmen. The original Marwadi scheme. The original Marwadi uh, success came from. So some a lot of Bengalis still believe that all this happened. All these people were created without the economy. or if you criticize them that no bengalis are bad at business then they will say that no 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 we were great at business okay if you were great at business then and if if you really eulogize that era when when bengal was doing so much business when bengalis were so great at business when there was a great economy then why aren't you harshly critical of the current times it's like congress supporters when they say that no no pre 1991 we didn't do any any mistakes with the economy uh, pc mohan no wish did great things but also Narsimha Rao was a great PM. Manmohan Singh le really turned the country around. Are they turned the country around from what? So they want credit for strangling you and also taking the hands off your throats. Okay. So Bengalis want credit for do, being great at business and saying that yes, economy was great back then. They also want credit. Also, they also don't want to get blamed for the economy being bad right now because after all, the most famous uh, one of the most famous Bengali songs in the last thirty years is that. Uh, তুমি আসবে বলে দেশটা এখনো গুজরাট হয়ে যায়নি ওকে দে আর হ্যাপি দ্যাট দ্য কান্ট্রি হ্যাজেন্ট বিকাম গুজরাট দ্যাট ওয়াজ রিটার্ন বিফোর অফ কোর্স মোদি বিকেম পিএম বাট নাও দে আর হোপফুল দ্যাট আটলিস্ট বেঙ্গল হ্যাজ নট বিকাম গুজরাট দ্যাট সাম হাউ গ্রেট থিং হিলারিয়াসলি ওয়েন মমতা ব্যানার্জি ওয়েন টু গোয়া টু ক্যাম্পেন বোথ বোথ দ্য বিজেপি অ্যান্ড কং অ্যান্ড তৃণমূল কংগ্রেস ওয়ার সেইং ইউজিং দ্য সেম স্লোগান টু গেট ভোট ফর দেয়ার ওন পার্টিজ BJP was saying if you vote for uh, Trinamool Congress Goa will become West Bengal and Mamta Banerjee was saying that if you vote for uh, Trinamool we will make Goa as as great as West Bengal so people just basically live in imaginary uh, uh, imaginary places in their heads Kolkata not from their original homeland in Raj, uh, Rajasthan so the Birlas originally made their money there so this was a real driver 
and then it all fell apart. And this is important to understand because when one thing falls apart, which is, let's say, you decide that, you know, uh, you're going to, for whatever socialist kind of reasons, you're going, you're going to wreck the economy, be very clear that everything else gets wrecked as well. And, and Bengalis actually almost agree that, yes, kind of things are wrecked right now. Why aren't we making great films? No, no, no. But the problem is, they say, yes, we are not making great films, but the reason is not economy. The reason is our taste has gone down. The central government education system has failed. The, the country is filled with that, that lower middle class Bihari types of people who, who do puja part and vote for BJP. That's why great movie making has stopped in West Bengal. And the person who is asking, yeah, why is Tagore uh, pronounced Tagore and not Thakur? I think it has to do with uh, the, the anti-caste uh, thing. Uh, that that strain in in Bengalis where they don't really want to be reminded of the the Thakur surname, okay? So the British called him Tagore, and they were happy with uh, happy to go with Tagore. So there is no such thing as a, a vibrant uh, cultural hub which is not also an economic hub. So this is important because this is also in the context. You know, many people ask me, why do you do work in so many areas? Why are you working in history? Why are you building this ship? Why are you uh, also working on the? Why don't you just focus on this? Yeah. They have completely misunderstood what we are trying to do. Yeah. In the end, I'm trying to rebuild a civilization. I'm not building just an economy. The economy is a... And I'm associating this with Arthashastra because first of all, he has read Arthashastra, but I, I bought the Arthashastra because he mentioned it. I didn't even know Arthashastra is randomly available on Amazon. I had heard of it when I was in uh, when I was a kid in school. I knew that it's probably li lying in some museum or something. I didn't know it's translated multiple times. It's, pro it's You can buy it and read it in a proper book form. So anyway... Arthashastra is not a book just about economics, right? It's not a book about just law. It's not a book about, about dharma. Okay, it's everything. It's statecraft. It's not even just a book about book about just statecraft. Okay, and that is the approach Sanjeev Sanyal is also taking. Part of it. But the overall purpose is rebuilding the civilization. So building a highway and rebuilding the Ayodhya temple are a part of the same agenda. And they cannot be understood separately from each other. What a powerful way, statement. All civilizations that go through a renaissance or a rebirth have this phenomena. The Europe, for example, you talked about it. Yes. Yeah. So if you look at the 13, late 1300s, 1400s, what happens in Europe? In northern Italy, not even in all of Europe. In small area, northern Italy, a whole small group of relatively small towns go through this explosion. Um, and you have Florence, for example, producing this amazing art. Venice produces this amazing art. But in fact, neither of those is actually, their, their real business is not art. It's actually, in the case of Florence, it's finance. Right, the banking. Right. They, what is their great invention? It is not uh, art. It is actually double entry bookkeeping. Uh, Venice's great success are maritime trade. It's the stock exchange. And so all the art is actually a sub uh, a thing that sort of happens on the side as a result of this. When you have wealth, these things are the side. No, I. that is precisely what I'm trying to tell you. That is the wrong way to think about it. What really is happening is an opening of mind, an opening of aspiration, which is manifesting in different ways. So the same people who were funding the art were also doing the banking and also doing, uh, sailing the shores. This sentence is very important because I'm a musician myself and this is one thing that 99.99% of my colleagues don't understand in the music industry that when the West Bengal economy will do well, when every businessman will have t time and money and resources for his own business and for his own fun, instead of do giving tola and, and taxes, that's when he will feel like, Let, let's fund a movie. Let's, let's see what profit can come out of it. Maybe maybe he'll want his daughter to be the heroine. Fair enough. He's not going to fill up the entire movie set with just his relatives, right? But today, the industry has, has hardcore corruption because the Trinamool politicians have so much power who are handling the, the producers and the Tollywood. Why? Because... Why does he have that power? Because he has been given so many responsibilities. If the producers were freer, they would actually be able to spend more money on art. And the biggest uh, high budget movie in Kolkata would not be made on 1.5 crores, even though it has three heroes and one heroine. Okay, and, and the most popular composer. So, uh, just a few days back, I, I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last live stream. I, 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 I was talking with a a friend who's a musician who is one of my main colleagues and he does not he's not really very political he has voted sometimes for cpm sometimes for trinamool he has no really hatred for bjp although he has one fallacy that a lot of people suffer from which is the fallacy that also beer biceps suffer, suffers from that he has four muslim friends therefore he thinks he know, knows all about islamic history muslims quran everything so i call it the four muslim friend fallacy 
तो दैट फ्रेंड ऑल्सो हैज फोर फाइव मुस्लिम फ्रेंड्स हु इन्वाइट हिम फॉर इफ्तार ईद एट्सेट्रा एंड देयर फॉर ही थिंक्स बीजेपी इज रॉन्ग टू बी हार्श टूवर्ड्स मुस्लिम्स इन सम वे एंड योगी आदित्यनाथ एट्सेट्रा बट ही डजेंट रियली सी मच ऑफ अ प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज आफ्टर ऑल दे आर डूइंग गुड डेवलपमेंट एट्सेट्रा बिकॉज सिंस ही गोज फॉर फॉर सिंगिंग शोज एवरी वेर इन द कंट्री ऑलमोस्ट एवरी मंथ सो ही नोज दैट द रेस्ट ऑफ द कंट्री इज डेवलपिंग एट अ फास्ट रेट वेर एज वेस्ट बंगाल इज बिंग लेफ्ट बिहाइंड but he was saying that uh see uh, see even even bengal tollywood's uh, artists they understand the value of investment why are you saying they are against capitalism so i said that no they think investors are somehow morally obliged to fund art but they but the moment we talk about overall business environment economy capitalism that's when they will say no no that's bad don't cut that tree here uh, regulate that business harder even though that same businessman is going to fund your movies is going to invite you to his corporate gig which do you want and by the way this entire phenomenon that i just mentioned starts on northern italy rapidly spread it goes to um The, the the it goes to the netherlands it goes to the uh, britain it goes to spain so the same people who are listening to um shakespeare write his plays and his first actual shakespearean plays for the, done for the first time the elizabeth in england are also the people who sank the armada huh it francis drake watch must have watched those shakespearean plays he mm-hmm. also is the guy who goes and circumnavigates the, the world so it's the same people who set up the first east india company uh, uh, same thing is going on meanwhile in the netherlands so what i'm trying to say is it is not surprising that kolkata was the hub of everything because it's very often were the same people doing all these different things they knew mm. each other so it's really a ecosystem of mind that happened and it's called the bengal renaissance in the same mm. way as you talk about the european renaissance so when it went into decline it was a closing of mind and the closing of mind happened didn't just happened in business and in commerce it also happened in science at about the same time right. it happened in culture yeah. it happened in uh, ev- every sphere of uh, human activity bengalis keep talking about the three nobel prizes in economics who don't work in kolkata who, who see no other state has three economics nobels right why are those uh, sit- uh, states richer i i know we have spoken about bengali comic hypocrisy for countless times but i guess there are more points to add if you find any bengali comic ask them what has those three nobel prizes gotten us no i guess in in economics we have just two nobels yeah so both of whom are alive both of whom go on writing books both of whom visit uh, the the state both of whom are basically one of them at least is is a is a open supporter of trinamool congress and mamta banerji why aren't the economics nobel laureates being a- able to improve the economy of the state I'm not asking uh, 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 Rubinath Thakur to improve the economics, uh, economic condition of the state. Okay, but anyway, uh, what Sanjeev Sanjeev is pointing out here that activity. Uh, so, in business and in commerce, it also happened in science at about the same time. Right. It happened. Where are Bengal scientists? We have grown up listening to uh, listening about so many Bengali scientists. Even where are the Bengali scientists today? Okay, in Israel there were of uh, a few, but I'm, we are talking about. like landmark changes in the world of science which were done by the bengali scientists of that era where are they why aren't they here because bengali education system everyone seems to be proud of okay why 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 aren't they producing them or whoever is achieving anything whether it's a nobel prize or actual tangible uh, contributions why is all of that happening in the fascist or imperialist usa or in the hindutvadi gujarat Beng- bengaluru or mumbai delhi etc why and in culture it happened in uh, ev- every sphere of uh, human activity so it is a- okay uh, kashyap you need to stay away from that person because suci is is farther left of trinamool congress and uh, cpim they are they are basically uh, naxalite they are, it's not even uh, a metaphor okay they are, they are almost naxalite they are just not that into arms as of yet or at least not that we know of extraordinary that not only did you know the birlas and all these people leave uh, kolkata and set up shop in mumbai and other places it is also the case that kolkata has never produced again somebody of the caliber of satyajit ray or ravindranath tagore or swami vivekanand or netaji subhash bose or sri aurobindo or uh, acharya jagadish chandra bose or any number of other names i can give you it just didn't produce hmm. anybody of that caliber yeah. when once things began to unwind everything unwound and what cost like like why did people elect jyoti basu or the socialist government in the first place 
so you know people elect all kinds of people for yeah. all kinds of reasons yes the question is why did they reelect him yeah. because having elected him it was quite obvious what he was doing yeah yeah even i remember in his first term which was i think 77 to whatever 82 or whatever yeah. the first term whenever he got elected um he already had carried out the mauri jabi massacre yeah. he had already begun to shut down um the uh, Industry. businesses yeah. uh, he already was mismanaging electricity supplies so, so that you know i remember growing up uh, doing my homework essentially by lantern and candlelight you know people have this thing ki mere pitaji bahut garib the and then he would sit under a, you know would do his homework by kerosene lamp and all that i also did uh, my homework by kerosene lamp not because i came from a poor family i came from a solidly middle class family but because there was no electricity and this was before the days of when generators were uh, commonly available so it was a this is one of the main reasons i like sanjeev sanyal vivek ramaswamy the mystery of sociologist these people are inside that ecosystem and they are being able to criticize that ecosystem that whatever whatever there is the flaw in that ecosystem okay he he is as elite as it gets okay he comes from a bengali brahmin family saint xavier saint james a uh, family of revolutionaries on one side family of moderates on one side sachindra sanyal okay he he knows it that he is from a privileged background but he knows exactly how hypocritical those people are he his criticisms are not about bengali rickshaw pullers his criticisms are always about the class he has grown up with that is the most brilliant part these are anti establishment people vivek ramaswamy that that's what makes me like these people so much they are so interesting and because you can't really question their honesty at all after the question is why did they keep getting him back despite lack of performance yeah you know you can try out anybody once why do you keep re- now some part of it was of course electoral m- malpractice uh, booth capturing was converted into mm. a art form mm. but i would argue that even more important than that was a poverty of aspiration if your society aspires that the highest form of life is a union leader or a you know uh, uh, an adda intellectual uh, what in kolkata is called a natel Uh, and you know that is guys you all know that i have mentioned this word right non bengali people i i i i would say i was the first bengali to introduce this word to you guys because that is a specific word atel is a distortion of the word intellectual actually there was a point when commies used to hate uh, intellectuals as well and uh, we have a family friend a uh, communist party member uh he used to call intellectuals as uh, intellectuale that their intellect is only in their jaws they don't have any real contributions but that was the era when cpim and and intellectuals had a feud it's not, it's gone now but the fun part is that the first criticism that uh, your highest aspiration was to be a union leader i don't uh, take that criticism too seriously because uh, again a, a rich bengali elite would never become a union leader it would mainly be f- anyone from a middle basically lower middle class who had no other way to uh, let's say let's say gain any tangible benefits by by staying alive even okay he had no jobs around him unless you say that everyone should have been uh, so so morally incorruptible that they uh, that everyone should have rejected all comfort and etc and let's say a uh, power but being a union leader was was a great way for for social upward mobility okay because remember these union leaders were the first person first people first group of people inside cpim who opposed who started opposing the the ban on english language in west bengal government board education systems okay because they had gotten some upward mobility because of being union leaders okay the fun part was they did not have upward mobility enough to send their kids to saint xavier's or lar martinier for boys etc or, or girls okay but CPIM who banned West Bengal uh, board uh, English education they the, the top leaders the upper middle class the brahmins etc they sent their kids to la martinier saint xavier's and later on outside uh, west bengal and outside india okay the problem that the union leaders faced was that in the in the early 2000s they started saying that okay now we we want our kids to do well we don't want our kids to become union leaders ab inko kaha bheje they don't know one 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 word of english or they they are not even good at english even when they are learning it at at like class 7 8 now what do we do so now please restart english that's when that happened so of course it's a legitimate criticism but that not significant because uh, at, uh, at least there's the excuse of poverty a lot of poor people were becoming uh, union leaders but but i think as uh, elon musk said a few days back it's a great thing uh, to remember that just because someone's an underdog don't just assume that's a good person okay we need to remember that that in many contexts 
but now he gets to intellectuals as well the the chai adda just discussions there are facebook pages in bengali called aajkal lad khete ho lad lage the the joke is that i'm feeling so lazy today that i'm too lazy to feel lazy today okay and that's a common joke among bengalis especially in kolkata and it's it's that that cancer has spread to uh, bengal suburbs as well that it's sort of a glorification that you see we bengalis are so um basically we have so much knowledge that we can spend a lot of our knowledge in discussing out topics while while being at the evening adda in in our neighborhood tea shop chai pe charcha of course and do just that but it's not someone doing that chai pe charcha after a day's hard work because today if you're in a private company you're not going to come out before 10 pm basically but it's the upper middle class who used to glorify this who did not really have any jobs or who had those jobs like is officers where they they carved out time for them to do, to talk and talk and talk and discuss and most first and most most importantly if they were academics then to you have ample time to just talk and criticize anyone and everyone without ever suggesting any tangible uh, substitute ideologies or or ideas anything okay those are the people we will get to in his uh, short story called the intellectuals so wait for that it is your aspiration that you are sitting around smoking and having uh, uh, sipping your old monk and uh, you know passing judgment on the rest of the world rather than doing anything and smoking throughout the day yeah you can smoke i personally have no problem with either of them your your health <laughs> but point to the matter that is the aspiration yeah. of the society if mrinal sen movies are the aspiration yes. of your society then do not complain that that is what you get yeah. hmm now this is the comment that that made trinamool congress call him mirjafar now i don't know if it's a self goal or not but hilariously in the last one week uh, the the discourse about whether sirajuddullah was a, was a great man or not and whether mirjafar was really the traitor we think he is or not that discourse had already started and today uh, trinamool congress ended up calling him mirjafar when when bengalis are at least uh, right leaning bengalis are ha- having a bit of a more sympathetic view towards mirjafar why because if you all don't know already that sirajuddullah was an evil man as pointed out by pointed out by Rars, arsi majumdar he was basically an, just another evil muslim king he used to pick up hindu women from the ponds in the evening when they went uh, went to have a bath after the days uh, cooking etc and people were so fed up with sirajuddullah that all the hindus the the king of krishnanagar raja krishnachandra rai whose descendant is basically now getting the ticket for bjp uh, another businessman called jagat shet and mirjafar who used to be uh, in the in the army of mirja uh, of sirajuddullah but all of these people conspired and and helped the british throughout sirajuddullah all of them it was a british muslim and hindu alliance against the evil acts of sirajuddullah that's the story so now people are calling krishnachandra rai Uh, and his family also traitors okay that why did they collaborate with the british etc and in fact narendra modi uh, told that woman the descendant of uh, krishna chandra rai rajmata amrita roy that uh, people will say a lot of uh, things ignore them etc narendra modi was telling her uh, telling this to her in the phone call but of course narendra modi does not know that how much the discourse is advancing in the ground level we don't even care if krishna chandra rai is is called a traitor okay we will just say yes he collaborated with with the right people to throw away uh, to 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 kick away a, a, a bad king fair enough but now shonjeev shannal is is mirja for apparently because he said mrinal sen kind of movies and i'm not sure exactly what he means but i guess the the black and, the glorification of black and white ethos okay why do bengalis love black and white so much and i'm basically trolling that when i have everything black and white here as well and my college my na- channel is also called college street kolkata for that very same reason i want to take away everything valuable that they they think they have i am destroying their idols i'm going to i i'm trying to leave them naked without any metaphorical property okay take away their their points of coalescing leave them propertyless they love proletariats so much make them morally proletariat okay now the black and white vibe Bengalis love the black and white vibe for one and only one reason okay which is that's when in the black and white era the best bengali movies were made that's the end of it there's no other reason shonjeev channel is pointing out that your, your this this affinity for minal shane and black and white black and white movies or the things he showed in his movies the the society he showed you love that so much whereas you don't criticize again the current society why don't you have 50 other minal sense now why are you stuck up with minal sen if your aspiration is only that whatever happened during minal sen's era that was the epitome the pinnacle 
therefore you will you will never progress anymore okay and in fact he gets to that in that story that that is how i was reminded of this story that we will have to discuss the intellectuals okay there also he brings up uh, minal shen's camera work etc in a sarcastic way and uh, suddenly from being the aspiration of society to being a scientist right by electing and you mentioned it's a complex world once you elect the wrong kind of government you set wrong kind of aspirations and it's no a- it's the other way around that's the point i'm making yeah. to you repeatedly So it is not the government that the journalist pissed off with the guy with the host now. And it's no, it's the other way around. That's the point I'm making yes. to you repeatedly. So it is not the government that causes this problem. It's the poverty of aspiration. It is the poverty of aspiration that leads you to these governments. Okay. Ultimately, every people get the leader they deserve. And, and if you deserve, if you want to elect, yeah. uh, you know, a Lalu Yadav, yeah. then you do not expect anything else as the outcome. And where did do people get this poverty of aspiration? so that i mean this is a huge uh, debate a sociological debate other people can work on it but it happens to every people at certain points in time so, some cycles are short some are long but if you look at uh, say um, you, the west all right uh, there was a time whether you like it or not they did conquer the whole world okay uh, brutal as it may have been it is also quite extraordinary that you know small country like uh, britain ruled over us 70% of the world yeah and you had uh, even more tiny country uh, netherlands controlled indonesia and south africa and all kinds of other places sri lanka so you you have to grant it to these guys that they were willing to take these things uh, these huge risks and they they had this sort of scale of thought uh, it is the europeans did create much of modern society the scientific uh, breakthroughs and so on uh, and the same thing happened with america in the in, in much of the 20th century uh, they aspired to go to the moon um, they aspired to create all the technologies that we today mm. create then at some point in time their aspiration shrank to which gender they wanted to have and so uh, i can assure you that the politics you are now seeing in uh, in america is a direct reflection of the poverty of their aspiration you see sandeep sanyal has moved on from uh, li- he, this is one step further of libertarianism even he is going into psychology what what a great point he's he's not saying that it's it's just because a bad government came and you started having bad things of okay that that is probably 50 60% of the blame but why did you stop feeling proud of his talking to americans now that why did you stop having the aspirations of of great satellites and and going to the moon etc because you got complacent every society gets complacent admit that and 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 and, and notice that you are getting complacent okay of course why didn't we keep having advanced ship building forever and after because we got complacent after making the best stitched ships in the world that that technology itself was the best okay so now he is pointing that out he is specifically calling that the poverty of aspiration that you you got complacent and stopped having great dreams your dreams was as a as a bengali person to make world class movies world class scientists world class philosophers i dare any bengali today to say he is doing anything world class okay patients and i can completely now relate and understand what you are trying to say first people choose their heroes and then they create their societies yes absolutely you ultimately become the heroes that you choose so when if your heroes are uh, you know union leaders union leaders and you'll get union yeah. leaders if 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 you if your uh, you know great economists are uh, basically uh, glorifying poverty then don't complain that you get poverty but because in- he's talking about amartya sen who shekhar gupta coined that term povertyism he calls those shekhar gupta is also a libertarian at heart he calls those people uh, those economists poverty uh povertarian is po- povertarianists each one of these things an economy arises out of it you know so you will get uh, an you know uh, uh, an entire povertarian system will emerge out of it you will get uh, ngos that will fund research that talks about certain kinds of uh, poverty uske liye paisa aayega then that money will be utilized now supposing it begins to actually solve poverty that's a problem hmm. because your business model is based on perpetuating poverty yeah the incentive structure is to have that poverty in place which is why i'm saying that sociology or or liberal liberal arts academia has not been able to solve the problem of caste based bad behavior after 80 years because it's not designed to do that the in, see when you make a framework or or a, or a company to build a, something very very niche and specific it will go on building that only no matter what you say your intentions are like planned parenthood in in usa it was it was created by eugenics eugenicists who believed that black people are stupid and should be killed they they had they created planned parenthood in basically black in in specifically black neighborhoods so that black population goes down today liberals commies wokes atheists are saying that no no black people suffer so much therefore they should have have easy access to abortion therefore they are glorifying that same planned parenthood 
sociology anthropology these these fields were created by the british to sow discontent in the indian society no wonder they haven't solved casteism so whatever is the incentive structure if an ngo profits of somewhere a poverty existing they will not solve that or 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 eliminate that poverty this was something even uh, bernie sanders said that if you directly benefit from something you will never be able to kick that th or eradicate that thing no matter what your intentions are no matter what you claim your intentions are i was uh, going through the book again because there's another story about an ngo okay without taking any names obviously it's it's written as if it's a fictional story about uh, about an ngo who who uh, tries to eradicate aids or something but in fact uh does statistical fallacy to to uh, to show that there is like uh 5% 10% uh aids patients still somewhere in india but that number is very huge and they they get funds for uh for for eradicating aids and they go on getting funds for eradicating aids okay so those are the people who he talks about do do read this read this book it's a very small book All, all all the entire book is uh, filled with just short stories all of which are 8 to 10 pages long it's called life over two beers B brilliant book a a entirely a sarcastic book about about elite societies of delhi kolkata etc mumbai it's like uh, i remember there was a theory that englishmen used to pay snake holders or people who used to catch snake so now people started breeding snakes yes and so i'll give you one example on which i have written myself very recently a newspaper article appeared recently in a leading uh, uh, newspaper in india and then it was carried in similar kind of ways in others as well that many millions of kids in india are zero food kids okay zero food infant so the babies basically 6 to 12 months old uh, 6 to 24 months or whatever they were called zero food infants okay and there are so many millions of them and then there was a this thing was based on a study that was published uh, which also mentions you know zero food this is actually a pretty mind boggling trivia he pointed out this is actually a bombshell this one is not getting any traction people are talking about upsc and mirza for and nminal chain this is a huge thing he pointed out here so i wonder look if there's so many millions of kids who are getting zero food then she should be they shouldn't be alive even yeah. so how are they even alive yeah. so i dug into this and by the way i've written this as an article in swaraj so other people who want to read it can So what I discovered that it wasn't actually zero food. What was going on? So there were these babies who, in the 24 hours before the survey was taken, had not been fed anything other than breast milk. Okay. Now breast milk is food. In fact, we have a huge campaign in India to encourage mothers to breastfeed their kids. Okay. Now supposing a child who's seven months old, mostly is fed on breast milk, yeah. but for the previous 24 hours has not been fed whatever porridge or something. then according to this survey he or she would be a zero food baby now of course there are millions of such babies in this country right is it a bad thing no in fact we encourage mothers to feed uh, breastfeed their babies and yet this was being set up in in a way that was suggesting that there is mass starvation of babies in the country which is absolutely not the case i mean there may be nutritional problems but mass starvation is not the problem and yet you were setting this up so i looked into this whole thing so this whole thing is a well oiled machine one of these billionaire uh, foundations will go and fund these studies then those studies will show either nutrition nahi hai vitamin d deficiency whatever whatever it is the latest thing that you want to sell to india and then it will be then next stage will be it will come out even more sensationalized in the uh, press so what will by the way guys this entire conversation this bombshell that he is dropping basically it it basically coincides with that same almost similar timeline when the us government approached through un or because of even i don't exactly remember we had discussed a paper about it when they approached china to do the single child policy that you you are having so, so much population how will you feed your population restrict your population to one child and and just work and work in the in the factories that's all you don't need to do anything else don't consume just export okay that was what sanjeev sanyal is at least pointing out here was also done with eugenics in mind too much population who will take over the wasp population what will happen is that public perception will be built up for a certain povertyian narrative and then that pressure will be used to carry out certain uh, policy interventions which you know are useful to whoever was the original uh, funder of the project and so you'll be sold medicines you will be sold baby food you will be sold uh, all kinds of things and by the way this is a very long history to this this is not a new phenomena this has been going on at least from independence and we know that all the baby food companies are american companies uh, yeah but you know 
I can tell you that this thing is a very old thing, and I'll, there are many well-known phenomena in India which have its origins in this uh, ecosystem of research uh, done by funded by these foreign agencies, hmm. and uh, then certain outcomes, which are then inter interestingly, those outcomes are then criticized by the same funding agencies for other purposes. And I'll give you yeah. one. And and this is a is a classic Abrahamic problem: create the problem, sell the solution. Example, which is fully documented. So. i want you to know this because this is a fully documented thing we all know that even now but is uh, till very recently we had a serious problem with uh, gender selective abortion huh? listen to this and no? because of which particularly in some of these northwestern states there was a serious uh, imbalance in the number of uh, boys being born uh, much in excess of the number of girls right yeah you all know this and india has been much criticized for this haryana has haryana been particularly punjab western up this is basically the zone where this happens and basically we are told this is because of uh, you know our inborn cultural uh, patriarchy uh, evil indian customs etc now let me tell you the actual origin of this bombshell back in the 1960s 50s and 60s there were a series of articles in western uh, journals uh, talking about how non white populations were growing very fast and then they would overwhelm the world so it was purely i mean quite offensively racist they didn't realize we would read them today but they are quite blatant about the fact that their main problem is that non white populations are growing very fast so it was decided by various departments at that time uh, geopolitical uh, powers of that time that there something had to be done about this because otherwise the world would be taken over by these uh, uh, brown and uh, looking people uh, <coughs> so a huge effort was done let us intervene in these countries to have population control so how were they going to do this so they decided that look the number of men does not actually matter it is the number of women that matters because they are the, you can have uh, uh, only one man and you can still have population growth if the, and number, number, number of women number. are there guys google and let me know when they did the malthusian model come up to to push for antinatalism so <clears throat> therefore uh, we need to do something about reducing the number of girls being born so here came the thought that what you can do is to weaponize sun preference in traditional societies now all traditional societies have sun preference not nothing mm. new even yeah. the west before they developed had a preference for suns which is you know and no one should ever be apologetic about it and no one should call that patriarchy and if at all they say that is patriarchy then you should just go and say that therefore there there is no such thing called patriarchy but defending or criticizing patriarchy dur ki baat hai ye agar patriarchy hai to patriarchy naam ka koi cheez hi nahi hai theek hai because this is not even a wrong thing patriarchy is necessarily a criticism right if this is patriarchy then patriarchy was just a normal good thing to do what are you going to do not not pref give preference to the person who is fighting the wars or or killing the tigers etc they are needed for work they are needed for war and so on so there is a sun preference but it's quite different from what happened next so basically the right malthusian model used to be uh, a fringe lunatic uh, uh, theory that got m mainstream support when the elite i sound like and rotate now okay the the matrix the the, the global elites uh d found its use okay just like transgenderism transgenderism was also created by john money with a, with a fake research whose research subjects said a few few years later that we were coerced into it we are not even transgender he basically manipulated uh, ma manipulated us and and, uh, uh, and and fooled us but by then the transgenderism paper got some credentials in in the fringes of academia when does it come in the forefront after 2008 financial crisis when the right and the left in usa is uniting against corporate uh, american uh, america okay wall street okay that's when corporate america decides that no 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 let's now push all the racial all the crazy race theories and gender theories into the forefront fund them fund the proponents of those theories so that the sh so that the conversation shifts away from us or directly economics or how corrupt we are or how much power we wield that is the main problem and instead here we have a society where the leftists in the country are the biggest uh, proponents of pharma and big businesses they are friends with these people just a few days back i don't know who but i think tim pool was saying that uh, republicans of today are basically 60s liberals that that's a correct thing to say how leftist leftist uh, leftist ideology or leftist ethos was was hijacked by by american corporate that is how we need to see even the malthusian model any any theory will be in the fringes but when they need to use it against you then they will use it against you see 
Andrew Tate is in jail. Jordan Peterson has lost his uh, ha- has has had to give up his tenure. He has lost his license. Jordan Peterson is being asked to take a re-education course. And now, two days back, Andrew Huberman is also people are coming after him. So you see, I think most other than uh, more than anyone else, it's the medicine industry who is the most powerful here. And if you if you really uh, try to shut their offices down and you and you affect their business, then you are very very he- heavily screwed. Okay, Andrew Huberman. See, people in America d- date date from the time they are 13, 14 years old. Okay, Andrew Huberman probably had a girlfriend since he was 14 when he went to his first prom. Now, five women, a lot of whom are anonymous, apparently made a chat group contacted each other and said that no 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 see and andrew huberman exploited us and were cheating uh, with us okay they, they, he was in relationship with us and but was not uh, actually dating just us okay so does that happen without organization and that news comes out in two papers on the same day does that happen without organization or without someone handling these women and telling them that yeah yeah do this do this so now people are pissed with Andrew Huberman and that's the similar thing going on with the uh, antinatalism etc and what Sanjeev Sangal is pointing out here with the um, uh, female feticide as, as well. That was absolutely co-opted that there is there is there seems to be something that we can use here. Okay it may be a fringe thing but maybe everyone doesn't kill their uh, newborn daughters but let's use it now because it gets us a lot of advantage. Came to India and they sold this idea to the Indian authorities in the 19, uh, late 60s and 70s. Of course, in the emergency, he had Nasbandi, etc. But the thing in which they really focused was something quite different. They basically, these whole bunch of these Rockefeller, Ford, even some UN agencies were involved in this. And they basically imported, with their funding, uh, ultrasound machines. And they basically said, that, look, this is great. Why don't you allow parents to actually choose their child? So now you're weaponizing a son preference. And they know why they're doing this. Yeah. Then the first several thousand of these sex selection abortions were happened in Ames. The doctors who carried out those operations with full support from these international agencies, they are still alive. And this is all well documented. And then in the late 70s and early 80s, they began to spread this message. So they were began to, you know, these so-called uh, these NGOs got into their cars. In those days, uh, SUVs were quite rare. So they were the only people who used to have these large SUVs and they're white colored SUVs from Lodi Road. They drove out in different directions. And if you then look at where the gender imbalances were the worst after after that in the 80s, 90s and so on, so they would go it north. was in those, in those, along those highways leading out of Lodi Road. Now, all of this is very well documented. If you, there's a book called uh, Unnatural Selection by a uh, Pulitzer winning journalist called Mara Huesenthal. You can get her book on Amazon. All of this is well documented that this this whole gen- sex selection operation was funded by these agencies um, in India. And these ultrasounds were brought in, the doctors were trained, the operations actually happened in Ames. And when it began to cause this imbalance in birth, who was blamed? Indian culture. Okay. And then the same agencies now have entire departments telling us how you know we should uh, have better XYZ for women. So what did they manage to do? They were first of all manipulating our population. They were creating a market for their ultrasound machines. Huh? So the same thing happens when you hear, you know, uh, there is a uh, uh, you know, huge uh, problem with vitamin D de- deficiency, this and that. Always be very suspicious about where these studies are being conducted. Because essentially what is happening, you, you are being manipulated. And going back to our earlier point, your aspirations are also being manipulated. Hmm. And so we really don't know, right, where this poverty of aspiration it can be a theory. It might have come from the West. No, no. Never so take some part of it is of course. Never take any research research seriously without first having gone through who has funded it. When I when I became vegan in 2015, every time in a debate I was uh, basically some some uh, anti-veganism article or a research was thrown into my face. That's when I learned that just go dig further, further, further. Follow the money, follow the money, follow the paper trail, and then you see oh it's funded by a big dairy corporation. <laughs> wow, great. Oh, it's funded by KFC. The research itself is funded by KFC. So beautiful. Of course. I mean, you are told that you should not aspire to have billionaires, right? You are told. Oh my God, look, you are, um, you have such uh, poverty, you should not have billionaires. Adani Ambani. Not today, Adani Ambani. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and I was growing up, we used to hear Tata Birla. Right? But my view is, 
why shouldn't indians be billionaires we are one sixth of the world's population one sixth of the world's billionaires should live in india yes right after all all the ngos that scream so much about this billionaire problem all of them are actually funded by western billionaires nice ha ah, soros is open society ha ah, omidyar ford rockefeller kon hai ye sab billionaire hain hmm. ha ah, the problem is not with gora billionaires if the billionaires is white it's perfectly fine it's with brown billionaires they have a problem why do they have a problem with brown billionaires i'll tell you why because india is so poor we shouldn't even aspire to send rockets in the sky then why can why should we have billionaires first solve the problem this is that uh, that that bullshit priority fallacy that anytime you see someone feeding a dog you go and tell them that why don't you do something for the humans first meanwhile you who are saying that you are not not, do, not doing anything for the humans not dogs but jo kutto ko khila raha hai usko jaake bole why don't you do something for humans first that is like that why don't you do something for the poor people first let let people who are sending rockets send rockets i can give you one example right which is closer mm. to the venture capital world the omidyar established the omidyar fund back like 15 years ago to fund the poor population of india recently they closed the fund in india and went back and they had huge like 50 200 employees for a fund it's large mm. and the reason was that india doesn't need us it's not that india doesn't need us india has stopped listening to their narrative absolutely they have stopped listening to the narrative they were trying to manipulate us and they were called out that is all there is to it and the same thing is happening so going back to this point of zero food please go and look at who funded it that paper tells you who funded it and they are the same people who fund similar studies and other things and so it is shocking that this not only is the problem of poverty of uh, aspiration very often this poverty of aspiration is slowly seeped into you a certain true movies yeah you look at the kinds of movies of india indian movies that will be given awards wahi povertyian wale aap garibi bolenge to aapko nobel prize bhi milega ha aap garibi bolenge to this is basically fed back into you that we should aspire for poverty yeah. like mother india was such a called out movie though it was a brilliant movie hmm. but it received international honors back in its day hmm. it was called like it showed the poverty of india no but at least in those days we were no, that also because it was probably made by muslims so everyone loved how how india was was the home of secularism in a hindu majority country muslims are making such good music and film that's always a thing to point out and therefore they support those things poor yeah. today we are nowhere near yeah. that poor yeah. and so this this change that you're seeing in india is a lot to do with the changes that are happening in our own heads and the heroes we are choosing now absolutely so the changes in our own heads and the aspirations we have we now say that we will build a better parliament we will build uh, the world's largest office complex we will go to the moon and at every stage notice these same people will come and tell you are why you are a poor country why do you want to do this yes we want to do it in fact you know the average uh, uh, auto driver who is very poor also feels a certain sense of pride that uh, india is sending a, a satellite to the moon right the, the auto driver is not saying that no no pehle mere auto mein rocket laga do fir uske baad rocket aasman mein daloge so why does he feel it because his aspirations have changed and so if you look at india as a map you will see you can clearly see the difference of uh, economic success is directly correlated to aspirational success so i'll tell you one incident i was recently in us in los angeles there was summit called mont gamli summit and it's held by montgomery family which is a billionaire family on every slide the the first slide was presented by the family the 30 slide so every slide had india at its forefront they are saying the absolutely the main reason is the upbringing and the population the population is there because we did not listen to antinatalists until now so that is a change that is a change we could have done this a generation ago maybe two generations yeah. ago but we didn't because our aspiration was ki hum garib rahenge and coming to a that tommy right which people call we want to build the best temples in india the largest the magnificent temples mm. and the best government buildings now and we are tearing up our old government buildings why is that it's the same logic so if you if you see go to shastri bhavan yeah. then you'll understand the poverty of aspiration these were built in the 50s now the government buildings of the previous generation which the the, the british had built look at them north block and south block whatever it may be they had genuine imperial ambitions and they expressed it right so you can disagree with uh, their colonial policies and all that but you cannot say that from their perspective they were not ambitious and that you know they as- aspired to signal power and whatever whatever it is that they were doing they did what did we aspire we aspired for building these concrete small concrete cpwd construction go to shastri bhavan or nirman bhavan or any number of other bhavans in delhi and this is central government yeah. state government ke to chhodi dijiye from 1947 till the now very recent building of the new parliament tell me one genuine serious building 
दैट पोस्ट इंडिपेंडेंस इंडिया बिल्ट नन राइट वो एक विधान सौदा बिल्डिंग बनाया था बैंगलोर में विच इज ओके इट्स डिसेंट साइज बिल्डिंग बट यू नो दिल बी द वेरी वेरी फ्यू रियली you know great yeah, this reminds me that the context we were discussing that when a framework is created to build something very specific it will go on building only that and producing only that regards of what your intentions are that is why ias is such a big problem okay the entire bureaucracy is such a big problem because that bureaucracy was meant to handle or to control or to extract or to exploit the masses of of the natives by a by a foreign power how can that exact same structure by you used now by by someone who has good intentions and do only good things with it it cannot happen that is why narendra modi used to be against the ias and he will probably show his true colors now which is why i think uh, sanjeev sanyal is being given a free hand here buildings it's only in recent times that we have begun to aspire to build big so this is and the aspiration we have so the same thing when we tear down uh, these uh, old government buildings what is the aspiration we have ki wo narrow lanes honge hmm. uske andar uh, bureaucrats baithenge wo hmm. wo wahan uh, uh, air conditioner hoga usme se dripping hoga the whole uh, and then you when you walk down those damp corridors you'll be uh, you can smell the toilet from anywhere along that is our aspiration right so it's not that people at that time didn't know how to build better because just a generation earlier they had built north block and south block ha huh? these are the same people whose forefathers had built Uh, you know uh, the meenakshi temple and uh, taj mahal etc so it's not like indians didn't know how to construct good buildings so why is it that we built shastri bhavan now yeah the answer is poverty of aspiration now sorry to digress back into our something we were discussing in the beginning that when i'm saying that ias should 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 get over this high horse of w- w- serving the country instead of just admitting that you like the perks a lot of bengali commies use that to criticize actually indian army people Uh, a big i think a lot of bengalis uh, turned right wingers when the pulwama attack happened and countless bengali commies were going around saying that i refuse to call those soldiers shaheed of course shaheed means something else in in entirely in the islamic context but chalo wo to theek hai kisi ko samajh mein nahi aayega but a lot of bengali commies said they don't want to call the victims of the pulwama attack uh, martyrs why their explanation was that they were just doing their job they were government servants and they died at their job that doesn't make them martyrs because if they are martyrs uh, would you call a, a manual laborer working for the government who accidentally falls into a manhole and dies is he also a martyr martyr because he is also uh, dying at his government job the the soldiers are also dying at their government jobs so they are both not martyrs or they are both martyrs so it it led to huge controversies everyone was, was taking everyone screenshot etc uh then then some uh, some some right wing kids basically went to different people's houses and made them apologize made them do uthak baithak etc L- lots of things happened back then uh, and interestingly i was also criticizing some person from ju a very senior person uh he used to be a musician at some point in his life and he he inboxed me and criticized me saying that why are you so pro war so pro military etc when you are a musician shouldn't you take a, a lesson from john lennon who spoke of peace etc i hate clichés and uh, those those are the clichés that i run from many such clichés i run from even now but you see uh if if now ias and soldiers are not different the victims of pulwama are in fact martyrs but if a fan falls on an on ias's head and he dies he is not a martyr why because there is one other thing of course om puri remember om puri also said that people become soldiers just for the perks what else why 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 give them so much bhav no it is different because the job security is there okay perks are there but there is the safety issue you might get struck with a bullet your body might end up in 50 pieces okay your relatives will probably get a scoop of your flesh to do your uh, last uh, last rites you are taking that risk that is not same as ias or 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 a manual laborer there's no life threatening risk yeah of course there's a risk that you might actually fall on in the manhole and die but that 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 is a bug not a feature when you are a soldier that is the feature you'll you'll most probably die w- what uh no i can't give galis now so the tearing down of shastri bhavan is the tearing down of a block in our head and it's an important thing to tear these buildings down because otherwise we were we will be caught in that and not only will we be caught in that we will be also encouraged 
to think that that is all we can aspire to so this and then when we have not succeeded rather than blame this poverty aspiration you will be blame other things you know uh, even by the 70s our economic growth was quite obviously floundering but who was blamed did we blame nehru or uh, socialism no we blamed hinduism hindu rate of growth and it's a very interesting thing like the west is criticizing india for building the statue of sardar vallabh bhai patel huh. they're saying it's not economically efficient and you could have spread. hindu rate of growth who came up with that idea and what what counter did the congress give back then i don't know it was the the prime minister was a fabian socialist his chief economic advisor was a commie pc molanovich and and a philosopher apparently who who did uh, uh, genetic studies to determine the size of the skull to to reaffirm the aryan invasion theory okay and that was the hindu rate of growth the product of their work was hindu rate of growth now the fascist rate of <laughs> growth apparently is the better one realize taxes better but now we have bill, bill gates coming in india and posing a video in front of sardar vallabh bhai patel and now they are praising it no no the point of the matter is they want us to go to america stand in front of statue of liberty yeah. and do a selfie yeah. Yeah. Mm. if we do it in front of a building we will see now that sanjeev sanjeev is making mentioning usa the commies will say that no no but there are not so many poor people in usa isn't it caste atrocities don't happen in usa but of course there are many poor people homeless problem to hai but it's not just statue of liberty when indians go to any country what do they pose in front of the rivers and mountains and hills look same same everywhere if you are going to some country and you want to pose in front of uh, some some man made thing you you will pose in front of the statue or or some man made structure which is beautiful very much or is historical and when that was being built there was some amount of poverty in that country there is no country which has completely eradicated and uh, or not have they stopped building man made structures completely that is their problem india mein bhi agar kar rahe ho so it is okay to do it in front of victoria terminus because they built it if we built it do it in front of one something we built then there is a problem and probably i think it will take some time to get over brown billionaires no i think it will happen faster than you think after all they 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 quickly accepted uh, chinese and japanese yeah. billionaires they have no problem with um, arab sheikhs so they'll get used to indian billionaires also in fact we need to get used to indian billionaires our problem is not that indian billionaires but our problem is we don't have enough of them i want more billionaires new first generation billionaires right. they will generate the jobs they mm -hmm. will generate the uh, the 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 energy and there should be continuous churn of them mm. thing is then it's not just a problem of bengal having the poverty of aspiration even bihar and kerala both of these states have followed the same and ended up having the same set of leaders yeah i mean bihar as i said what was the, just like bengal aspired to pseudo intellectuals and uh, union leaders bihar aspired to small time local goon politician or upsc or upsc yeah so in in an environment where those are the role models you can either either you can become a local goon if you don't want to become a local goon you know your way out is to basically become a, a civil servant now even see this is exactly what i'm talking about even bengal right be an academic or be a gunda that although it's better than being a goon even that is a poverty of aspiration i mean at the end of it why you know if you must dream surely you should dream to be elon musk or mukesh ambani why did you dream to be joint secretary yeah are you not dreaming to be sachin and bini bansal of flipkart yeah so that's the point i'm making so you <laughs> need to uh, you know think about uh, how a society thinks about uh, risk taking and scale and so on so i think one of the one of the problems of uh, say a place like bihar is not that it had bad leaders the bad leaders are a reflection of what that society aspires for mm. so if you are aspiring for this you will get it so i think this what is happening thankfully is country across the country the our aspirations are changing now of course not everywhere i still think way too many young kids who have so much energy etc are wasting their time basically trying to crack the upsc yeah. mm. i'm not saying you don't want people to take the exam yes every country needs a bureaucracy that's perfectly fine mm. but i think, think lakhs of people spending their best years trying to crack an exam where a tiny number of few thousand people actually going to get in mm. makes no sense the same, if they put the same energy into doing something else you know we would be winning more olympic gold medals mm. we would be seeing better movies being made we would see better doctors we would see more um, you know entrepreneurs uh, and scientists and so on so I, i would say that same energy put into something else so i would say it's a, it's a waste of time and i i always discourage people unless they really want to be you know a administrator they shouldn't take the upsc exam i mean if they real because that many of them after having gone through it then they get frustrated through the course of their career in the end you know uh, Uh, life and bureaucracy is not meant for everybody and large parts of it as with any profession but large parts of it are largely dull and boring and about passing files up and down I mean, 
um, and unless you really wanted to do it, and you, you, you know, you're not going to be particularly happy with it. I'll, I'll share one more anecdote with you right now. In India, it was unheard of. And, and, and consider how, how significant this is in changing the, nudging the discourse conversations in the, in the homes, in the bedrooms of families in India today. Okay, that, see, mom, even the chief economic, economic advisor of Narendra Modi is saying that, let's not do the UPSC, let's, let's do other stuff. Imagine the value of this, this particular podcast episode. Husband, wife, couples are entrepreneurs. That is now happening in holds and holds. So Indian society as a whole is giving up security as a notion. Why we claim for UPSC or even 50,000 people lined up on a railway station for a few thousand police jobs, which has been recently right in Kanpur. No, this, will have, this is still happening. But I'm trying to say it is changing. At least in the middle class, it has significantly changed. Uh, people are taking risks. And this is going back to my original point. This is an opening of mind, which does, is not just happening in that little space of entrepreneurship. This is a change of attitude. And this change of attitude will manifest itself in everything. It will manifest itself in science. It will manifest itself yes. in um, uh, in music, uh, in literature. I mean, there's an explosion of Indian, uh, you know, Indian literature as well. Uh, there is the all kinds of innovation will happen because we we will naturally live in this world where doing new things and so on is thought of being as a natural thing that you know people do and it is encouraged, uh, as opposed to uh, what happens even in Indian intellectual life, for example. One of the things that will strike you, it's true of Indian academia to this day, that when you go through a certain argument, the argument is not ultimately won by virtue of the logic from first principles or from the evidence you bring. Ultimately, the argument is won by quoting authority. <laughs> Gandhi ji ne kaha tha. Oh. Uh, or Ambedkar ne kaha tha. Whoever nice. happens to be your favorite great. Okay. That is a society that is not thinking uh, uh, in an expanding way. It has already decided yes, that... Of course, I also do this, do this a lot of time, but that's usually to counter someone who is saying that, no, no, see, uh, since Ambedkar said this, therefore BJP is bad. So I, I point out Ambedkar also to them. But yes, what a great point. This is how you nudge discourse in, 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 the, in the other direction, in, in, another, in a different direction. This is what we need to do. We need to stop quoting authorities. Argument on, on based on, argue based on what you know. Stop, stop recommending me videos or anyone. Stop recommending anyone videos, documentaries or a book. Mug up all those arguments yourself. Understand those arguments yourself. And if you believe in them, then believe the argument. Okay, or, or in that ideology, etc. Quoting to authority is, is so common in, in, uh, in, while debating people. That the ultimate has been said already by somebody and that is the limits of knowledge. In, as you mentioned, right, our poverty of aspiration led us to cling on to Gandhi ji. Gandhi ji has a profit, has a profit. That's it. Point of the matter is that, is a, that is essentially a society that is not progressing. It is already jammed up because you have already defined uh, what is uh, progress by some great, whoever happens to be your great. And yes, uh, we have in the last 25 years. If Shonjeev Shannal is Mirja Ford and a traitor, I am, I am traitor on steroids. Case studies of cities like Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, obviously New Delhi could come, getting developed. But in the recent past itself, like Uttar Pradesh is changing its image dramatically. Yes, so that's why. So sometimes you need to actually do an external shock, so to speak, begin to change that dynamics. And I think you are seeing that in a place like Eastern UP. Uh, Western UP, Tika, Noida, Vida, they have access Absolutely. to Delhi. They anyway were coming out of that. But I think what is happening now is very visible in Eastern UP. Um, uh, started, of course, with Varanasi. But now with, uh, if you look at Ayodhya, new airport, uh, the kind, you know, the big new temple. Is this uh, section so important? The, the changing dynamics of that is quite, uh, you know, quite visible. The highways that are going through, the train stations. We are no longer thinking in small scale, you know, thinking in stuff that, yeah. you know, our great grandchildren will be proud to look at. That's mm. how we think about it now. First time. And Gujarat building is the first gift city of India. Yeah, yeah. So okay, guys. I now let's go to what he has mentioned roughly in the print video. I don't know what he has said there. Sanjeev Sanyal, UPSC. We'll go through this quickly, then we'll discuss his story. We have with us Sanjeev Sanyal, who's Prime Minister's uh, economic advisor, of course. And recently, one of his comments on the UPSC exam went viral on uh, social media, essentially. And what you said, Mr. Sanyal, I found it so uh, so important, so significant, because mm. uh, there was a phrase you used that this obsession with the UPSC exams kind of reflects the poverty of aspiration. Um, before we get into how this poverty of aspiration manifests itself, can you um, weigh in on where you think it comes from, sociologically, economically, culturally speaking, why are Indians obsessed with the UPSC exam? So let me be very clear what I was talking hmm. about. Yeah. <clears throat> this is not about reforming the bureaucracy, whether it's efficient, sure. non-efficient, uh, technocrats versus generalists. This, is nothing, not, this conversation is nothing about the bureaucracy as it exists. Sure. I have views on how to improve its efficiency, but hmm. this is not about that. Exactly. This conversation was not even about that. This was about about ground level aspirations that no no stop stop focusing only on that because he has said that uh, you need both kinds of people we need people who special who have specialized knowledge therefore technocrats and we need people who have a cursory understanding of a lot of things and which is called general knowledge 
In fact, it's not about the bureaucracy at all, or even about the UPSC exam itself. Hmm. The problem is that what has happened is that there is now a almost cult-like uh, group of people who are call themselves the UPSC aspirants, hmm. and this is there are lacks of such people uh, who take this exam year after year. Um, much of them spending large part of their twenties repeatedly taking this exam, hmm. uh, sometimes into their early thirties as well, hmm. and. It appears to me that this is a huge waste of youthful energy. Hmm. I mean, it's perfectly okay to take the exam once or twice. Uh, you know, every country needs a bureaucracy. If young people want to join it, great. Hmm. Uh, but what has happened, as I said, is become more like a religious cult. In fact, it's complete with uh, all the manifestations of it, including uh, preachers who do motivational videos. Um, you know, go out and pro proselytize. Uh, it has its own rituals, and hmm. to the point that even those who succeed in these exams can't seem to leave the cult. Hmm. So you have people who have actually succeeded. I mean, they have really won the lottery. They are in, you know, the in one Indi of the services, but they are aiming for IAS. Yes, they, hmm. they are in the Indian Revenue Service or one of the other services, but they are still taking the exam to get into a higher service. Hmm. So it it clearly is the you know every manifestation of being an addic addiction or a cult, hmm. Hmm. and I think it's just very unhealthy. Right, but again, going back to my question. Where do you think it comes from? Is because for the longest time, um, the bureaucracy has been a symbol of power. It's to begin with, it's a permanent, stable, secure job, and two, it exudes a lot of power. So for a lot of people who would otherwise in their lives feel very helpless, socially, economically, and so on, this can be that one big ticket. Hmm. So is that the part of the reason why are we so obsessed, culturally so obsessed with? That is what I was talking about in the in the context of uh, union leaders as well. That was their some people, some power hungry people. That was their sole way of getting some some semblance of control over their lives or some comfort etc the UPSC. so this is this is, this and, is and what that i'm question did not change with liberalization with kind of the coming of private jobs or do you think it changed a little bit so this is this is exactly the point that i'm trying to uh, sort of dig into hmm. see i i am of the crossover generation so hmm. india liberalized its economy in yeah. 1991 i was at university hmm. and even at that time there was a group of people who took the upsc exam and there were people who who would go off to jnu and pretend to do their uh, phd but in fact they were preparing for the upsc exam fine and you know since since there were not, not many other jobs, hmm. uh, I understand that. Uh, and in, while I was at university, that began to change. Hmm. And so you suddenly had people who did the CAT, got MBA, got various kinds of jobs. Later, it became people set up startups, and you know, a wider array of, of aspirations appeared. Hmm. Now, one would have thought that that would dissolve in many ways this obsession with UPSC. But there are parts of India, and Bihar being one of them, hmm. uh, to some extent UP, maybe some parts of Rajasthan, whatever, where there is, in fact, in some ways, an even greater obsession today with getting into UPSC hmm. than there was uh, 30 years ago. Hmm. Now, as I said, this is not about simply lack of jobs. Uh, uh, you know, there is um, lots of jobs uh, in other areas that didn't appear 30 years ago. You know, I, I have to interject here and I have to ask you, there was, um, again, we can have debate over the report itself, but there was, in fact, this morning, a report from the International Labour Organization that came out on the uh, Indian sort of the status of employment in India. And it said that the share of youngsters with secondary or higher education in the total unemployed youth has almost doubled from 35% in 2000 to almost 65% in 2022. So this youthful energy that we're talking about, a lot of comments on your tweets as well said, okay, but these people are educated and they feel like they have nowhere to go to and that's why they get into this uh, cycle of all So I, I, let me say, hmm. it's not like they aren't putting in a large amount of effort. Hmm. Many of these people, if you read those comments, hmm. they actually left perfectly well-paying jobs. Hmm. And as I said, there are people even in the IRS or the railways or even the IPS, which is one of the more coveted hmm. things, hmm. who are writing this exam over to and over again to get into the IS or IFS or whatever they think hmm. is higher up the hmm. value chain. So there may be other problems of generating jobs and so on. And in a country like India, that is to be taken seriously. But that is a different debate to be had. Hmm. Here, I'm just dealing with a one peculiar problem, hmm. which is an obsession, which I think is hurting a large number of people. Hmm. And uh, in the end of this cycle, uh, there are a large number of young people who would have had perfectly good jobs in other fields. Uh, had they you know, taken one or two attempts and then carried on with their lives. Is there something about the culture of the government which also feeds into this obsession still? Of course, we have had the Prime Minister talk about getting rid of the Babu culture in many ways. Yeah. But do you think there's still something about the system of the government that... Yes, so this is where I did... I mean, the context in which I brought this in hmm. is in the context of poverty of aspiration. Hmm. That there is, particularly in Eastern India, this the people are stuck in, in this poverty of aspiration problem particularly. And no wonder why in Eastern India is there no mystery there? Because Indi Eastern India has no industry and is full of corruption. Why, why aren't Gujaratis uh, studying all day for UPSC? Uh, we talked about, of course, this being there in Bihar. I'll take you to my own home state, West Bengal. Mm -hmm. What is the aspiration there? Uh, for a long, long time, the aspiration was to be a union leader or to be an Atel uh, intellectual. <laughs> so guess what uh, Guess what? Bengal got? It got union leaders and Atel intellectuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and the economy fell apart. He is uh, mainstreamizing that word now, Atel. Good, good. Use this as a gali now. So, as I said, we have to be very careful about who you are taking as your heroes and as a society because very likely you are going to 
hmm. end up essentially getting that and ironically a lot of these coaches that you mentioned are these people putting up motivational videos uh, they themselves are not part of the ias system and they are making probably a lot more money than ias officers one so in fact uh, they the, the people who are doing this coaching classes are in, indeed uh, you know minting money as cult leaders and they are themselves proof that uh, since they are making as you said uh, much more money than uh, you could joining the bureaucracy and, and i i thought see the 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 podcast with the with the guy with the braces that was probably shot 2 3 weeks back right so i thought after the podcast came out he probably got some pushback so maybe before election modi so, uh, uh, told him to do this interview to maybe calm things down a little ye to aur bhi aag laga raha hai ye ye kya bol raha hai this is this is that that podcast on steroids notice that they themselves not joining the bureaucracy yeah. uh, suggest to me uh, that you know the power of entrepreneurship is uh, is very powerful <laughs> exactly. uh, that you know the people who are doing the coaching classes are themselves uh, uh, all entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs yeah yeah uh, i have to ask a question because it's so pivotal to this debate which is the coaching uh, center this coaching industry almost and you spoke about how there are uh, entire cities uh, which kind of thrive on this business uh, we Uh, maybe I don't know if for UPSC, but for so many exam competitive examinations, we have cases of children, young people committing suicide over and over again, and uh, people kind of being lured into coming into these kind of coachings over year after year. Do you think the system needs any kind of regulation? Well, it's difficult to say whether this requires regulation. Uh, it certainly requires a public debate, which is what I'm trying to to trigger. Mm -hmm. That look, you know, it's perfectly fine for people who want government jobs, uh, but you know, to have this kind of obsession. Uh, to go through this over and over again mm. in the face of fact that there are actually many uh, opportunities remember the people who are attempting these tests are not uh, the people with no education otherwise we won't be able to take the test these right. are uh, usually people with at least a university mm. education mm. so yeah. it's not the case that many of these people could not get other jobs mm. so you know this debate about unskilled labor etc is a completely unlinked to this right conversation. right uh, do you think it's a peculiarity that uh, of india that uh, the private sector does not evoke that kind of either obsession or just that kind of aspiration as so i think a, this is precisely what i'm trying to say and look, why do you think that's the case why has so the private sector uh, not managed to create this so it depends where you are hmm. to be fair if you were in mumbai hmm. uh, you are not uh, aspiring to become a civil servant in mumbai you aspire to be a stock broker sure. or movie star or um, hmm. or an industrialist or hmm. some such other thing hmm. or if you are in bangalore you are trying to do a t technology startup hmm. or something else hmm. so it, this is it is the case that there are parts of india where this is not an issue hmm. i mean I, hmm. there aren't large numbers of people in gujarat for example who are <laughs> have this obsession it's a much smaller yeah, problem yeah yeah gujarat officially has the least amounts of uh, ias aspirants I think it's a poverty-related obsession as it well. Is not, from well, it may be, states, it from may be from poorer states, but I, I think the point I was making is that this is circular. If no, no, a commie journalist, boy, it's not a poverty issue. It's an opportunity issue. So poverty, jahan bhi hai, wahan pe hi IAS ban jayenge. Therefore, poverty is directly the blame. It's that that is not the case. Even if it was a poor state, but there were different kinds of let's say small scale industries, then even then so many people would not aspire to be IAS. Especially if the IAS was not such an evil colonizing structure. Okay, because people get to enjoy so much perks and and insane ungodly powers. That is why uh, the 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 value for IAS. Operations are limited. You will get that outcome. Hmm. because in the end we are a democracy hmm, hmm. right we get ultimately elect the leaders we want hmm. so if you elect leaders who will give you union leaders hmm. and and atel intellectuals hmm. then right. you will elect jyoti basu hmm. 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 so if you your aspiration is a local goon politician hmm. then you will get local goon politician hmm. Hmm. yeah and if you don't want to be a local goon politician then your aspiration will be at most okay civil servant hmm. 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 so what i'm trying to do is to people to break out of this hmm. so it is people think that poverty is leading to this problem hmm. i am arguing it is the other way around it's poverty of aspiration that leads you to this problem hmm. and as i said i am a first i'm the first hand witness of what happened to kolkata hmm. poverty of aspiration destroyed kolkata where does it come from is what are uh, you you can have that that maybe a large there's a public debate on this so maybe we can have a sociological conversation on this or maybe researchers can work it out hmm. Hmm. but this is not unique to india or our point in history hmm. Hmm. look at what is happening to the west hmm. uh, these are people who used to uh, you know have aspirations of uh, uh, going to the moon uh, they had aspirations of uh, discovering new drugs discovering okay m shastri is bringing up something uh, uh, interesting why do you think m shastri that, that is because uh, is 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 the state uh, government uh, exam a little easier to give than the ias and does that mean therefore a, a, a poorer section is aspiring for the state government exams and not the ias ones because the ias ones are usually pursued by people who have completed their education to a, to a great extent Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and all mm -hmm. that. Now they are into discovering gender, so they are getting. Therefore, their politics and aspirations reflects their uh, mm -hmm. what has happened to much of the West as we speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would argue that it is the poverty of aspiration that leads to 
hmm. the problems, not hmm. the other way around. Uh, I have to conclude by asking this. Uh, you know, one of the more popular sayings uh, about IAS officers is that India mein teen post hai, wo, they exude the maximum kind of power, which is PM, CM, and DM. So, do you hmm. think this whole persona aura of a DM in a village hmm. that needs to be changed in order to change the aspiration that the DM's uh, office evokes in the minds of ordinary children? No, I think them? let's not blame the poor DM. Hmm. In fact, no, I'm talking about quite separately. No, quite hmm. separately, let me tell you, it's actually a real uh, one of the issues which I will discuss in a different context. We really need to begin to reform our bureaucracy and give the DM more powers. The way the, the bureaucracy is set up, hmm. the poor. DM, although he was expected to deliver all the services, hmm. he's the junior most person in the cog, cog yeah, in the wheel. Sure. Right? Some 32, 33 year old who's expected to deliver all these services. Hmm. He is too junior to even ask for help from the hmm. because his seniors in, in the state capital are not going to even pick up his phone. And he's expected to deliver on the ground. I think it's totally unfair. We need to rethink our way our bureaucracy runs. Hmm. Uh, and that's a different debate I want. So I think we need we do need hmm. uh, a serious reform in our administrative system. Hmm. But I think it is unfair to blame the individual bureaucrat or the individual DM for being un unable to deliver because the system has not no, been no, no, no. set up for delivery of services. It's been set up for control. Hmm. So you're getting that. Hmm. And yes, so since it's about control, you are therefore creating this <coughs> persona of uh, power yeah. and authority. Yeah. And but that the poor is person, that every kid is growing up to see. Yeah, maybe uh, that is part. Because Mukesh is so much more uh, far for them, even aspirationally. Well, maybe not in Mumbai, as I said. Exactly. But, but, but you know, are... so many, some of them want to be Shah Rukh Khan. That's okay. Yeah. But my point is, look, we live in a world where some people should want to be Shah Rukh Khan. They should want hmm. to be P.T. Usha. Hmm. Hmm. We should want to be a scientist hmm. Hmm. and so on. And we need to widen this out. Hmm. And this is not this is not about thinking, oh, we'll create the aspirations and things will change. Hmm. I'm just flipping the whole thing on its head and saying, no, hmm. only when we have those aspirations will the thing change. Hmm. 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 So it is the poverty of aspiration that is the driving force right. of the problem, right. not the problem that is leading to these aspirations. Right. Mr. Sanyal, thank you so much for taking out this time to speak to us. And the next time we meet, we will discuss. Yeah, M. Shastri clarified a lot of things. Thanks for this uh, important data because, okay, now we are going to start the story. But also, see, if, if those poor people apply for those things and they, they are not MMA fighters or, or great uh, singers, of course, I, I don't blame them. This is not about blaming individual people. And therefore, I don't even have any hatred for Sanjay Dikshit even now. This is like me criticizing bodybuilding. I have massive respect for bodybuilders in terms of how much uh, hard work, discipline they put in. But... Just because you are a bodybuilder does not mean you will be able to defeat anyone in a fight in the street. That is the mistake bodybuilders may make. They think that that is the pinnacle of fitness. But I don't mean that bodybuilders are bad people or that they don't have, they don't work hard or something. That is the same thing with, with uh, aspiring for these jobs or even in the state level. Especially if you are a poor person, especially if you are a first generation one. You are being given a reservation, so, so you are going to take it. What can we do? But see, the incentive structure is there also. There is a pushback factor and the pull factor. What the Sanjeev Sanyal conversation does is nudge the push factor into a different direction, at least on the family level. Okay, now, this story is about Kolkata intellectuals written by Shonjeev Shannal. In the year, uh, when, is, when was this first published? This was first published in 2018, okay? The story is called Intellectuals. A short story. Insanely hilarious. This entire book is filled with hilarious, sarcastic stories about Delhi elite, Bombay elite, uh, bureaucracy and Kolkata elite. Okay, Listen to this story. The yellow ambassador taxi rattled to a halt by the side of the street. It was hot, humid and crowded with pedestrians, hawkers and vehicles of all description. Stalls of second-hand books, their wares piled high, seemed to spill over from the footpath onto the road. Holly, a person of a, a name of a person, Holly looked around from inside the taxi and decided that it was the right place. She paid the driver without haggling, even though she was sure that she had been overcharged. Then she stepped into the sun and the uh, and the noisy bustle. <clears throat> so Bengalis know what what place is being described here. Okay, let's see how many of you all can guess. Bored hawkers turned to look at her with curiosity. It was not that they were unused to seeing a white foreigner and walking down the street. A couple of them drifted through every week, but they were usually backpackers and occasionally exchange students, like wandering around trying to get the quote-unquote authentic experience as promised by their guidebooks. For, for some reason, they always looked scruffy and dressed in the peculiar loose cotton tie and dye that a certain class of backpackers believe makes them look like they have quote-unquote been out there. That's why don't they don't dress in their usual jeans and t-shirt etc. which we feel like wearing all the time because it's so comfortable. But when foreigners arrive on Indian soil, they, they try to dress like hippies because they try to give off the vibe that they are not just another white guy. Even more inexplicably, some of them sported a checked uh, Palestinian keifa wrapped around their neck like a scarf, entirely unsuitable for the humidity of a Bengali summer. 
as if the piece of cloth somehow signaled their solidarity with the sufferings of all of the third world. So I am wearing a Palestinian scarf here. Therefore, you see, dear Bengali commies, I am your friend. Holly, however, was dressed in a light business suit and her hair was neatly set. She gave the impression of a corporate professional. She scanned the decaying colonial era buildings that hovered over the street and tried to guess which one housed the coffee house. Finally, she walked over to a tea stall owner and asked for directions. Okay, yeah. So guys, people, Sanjeev Sanyal is talking about College Street, Kolkata here. <laughs> the place called College Street, which is where the famous Presidency University is. The entrance to the building was somewhat, somewhat different from what Holly, Holly had expected. She had heard about how the coffee house was the intellectual epicenter of the city, but the stairwell she now found herself in was crumbling and was half blocked by an old scooter and flanked on one side by a wall of exposed electrical wires, as it happens in old buildings. There were people going in and coming out, so Holly decided to take her chances and walk up the stairs. One floor up, she found herself in a large hall with a high ceiling. That is the main coffee house room, okay, where everyone hangs out. That is where the main, uh, that is the epicenter of atelism in Bengal. Rows of tables, <clears throat> uh, yeah, rows of tables filled the hall even as hanging ceiling fans stirred the sultry air. There were many people sitting about drinking tea or coffee, chatting and arguing amid the tinkle of spoons, stirring sugar in ceramic cups while an imposing portrait of the great poet, meaning Rabindranath Thakur, looked down at the scene from a peeling yellow wall. Peeling yellow wall, okay? So, so the, the entire place is dilapidated, but there, uh, the, that, the epicenter of intellectualism, that's where the, this discussion is going to take place. The place had clearly seen better days because, yeah, even all the legendary Bengalis used to come there to hang out. Shottajit Rai, Manna De, everyone. Manna De's famous song, Coffee House. Coffee house is she at the Taj or nay. Again, that was full of nostalgia that we don't uh, have hangouts at the coffee house anymore. That was the name of the song. Holly wondered how she would identify her contact person as she scanned the room. She had just arrived in the city the previous day and had only ever exchanged emails with him. Fortunately, someone waved to her from across the hall and walked up to her. Dr. Holly Katz. Yes, and I'm, I presume you are Biplob Mullik. Hope you did not have trouble finding coffee house. Everyone knows it. Biplop Molik. Swanjeev Channel starts the story with, with trolling and more trolling and more trolling. So Biplop, as you know, means a revolution. So Holly replies, hope you did not have, uh, no, Biplop Molik replies, hope you did not have trouble finding coffee house. Everyone knows it. Holly replies, no problem at all. And thank you for arranging this meeting with your group of eminent intellectuals. <coughs> Biplop Molik says, best minds in the country, madam. We have been meeting here twice a week for the last 35 years. Real thinkers, not like the shallow fellows in Delhi, arguing loudly on television every night. Biplob led Holly to a table where five others were sitting. Four men and a woman, in their 60s, with greying hair. So all of them have, have become kind of old. All the men were in half-sleeved, checked shirts, untucked and leather sandals. Remember this description. This is how uh, a Bengali intellectual dresses if they are in their 60s and 70s. The lady was in a cotton sari with a fading brown and grey pattern, her oily hair tied tightly in a neat bun. On the table were several half-drunk cups of tea and coffee as well as books and newspapers in Bengali and English. Holly quickly surmised that the leader of the group was a man sitting, in the directly, uh, sitting directly under the portrait of the great poet. He does not mention it's Rabindranath Thakur but obviously that's hinted here. While the others sat on cheap plastic chairs, so he, may, he is pointing out a hierarchy here that the most important guy in the group sits in the, in the good chair in front of Rabindranath Thakur and everyone else around him is sitting on plastic chairs. <coughs> genius, genius penmanship here. While the others sat on <laughs> cheap plastic chairs, he sat on, he sat on a large wooden one that had probably survived from the colonial era. A, a, a tall man with a pot belly that uh, pushed against his loose shirt. He sat with an air of detached authority. A confident smirk under his thick framed glasses. Let me now Bipla Mullik is saying, let me introduce you first to Dr. Shurojit Haldar. He used to teach post-colonial literature at DK College and writes regularly on important national and international matters. Just before you arrived, we were discussing his latest column on sports policy. He was very close to the previous chief minister, but the government changed. Otherwise, he would have been the head of the department. <laughs> this intellectual who, who teaches post-colonial literature 
would have become the sports minister if the previous government had stayed. Listen to what Sandeep Sanyal is insinuating here. <laughs> Shurojit nodded and smiled benevolently. Yes, that is the case. And this is Robin Shen. He makes documentaries uh, and experimental art films. Very famous. Even won an international award in Prague in 1987. <laughs> Robin corrected. It, no, it was Warsaw, 1986. Biplop went on undeterred. And this is Asad Ali, social worker and Marxist poet. He was also an MLA in the 90s but decided to leave active politics and work full time for the uplift of the masses. He can tell you everything about grassroots. <laughs> and Gayatri Di. <laughs> he is calling this Bengali leftist intellectual Gayatri Di. This is of course trolling Gayatri Spivak. And Gayatri Di. She is a great scholar of economic geography. First class first and gold medalist in 1977. She has written a seminal paper on the cooperative movement in the brass utensils industry in East Midnapur district. Even Americans know her. <laughs> she is a member of the National Geographic Society. <clears throat> Every line is, is full of trolling. People who are Bengali will, will, will enjoy this more. But listen to this because in the next paragraph he goes even harder into the trolling. Okay. So he's saying, uh, Biplop is saying, even Americans know her. She is a member of the National Geographic Society. Okay, now, Holly wanted to say that anyone who subscribed to the National Geographic magazine was called a member, but she held her tongue. <laughs> Nevertheless, the woman in the sari would maintain a cold distance throughout Holly's stay in the city. She did not really me uh, meddle or, or mingle with, with Holly that much. And as you know, Biplav is saying, I was a journalist, but I'm currently currently editing a book on the dialectic materialism embedded in the works of 19th century poet Michael Madhusudan Datto, whose books, whose biography was, by the way, ordered by Savarkar when he was in prison. With that, Biplav sat down. Holly noticed that he had left out the small mousy man at the end of the table. Okay, someone went uh, un went ignored. She would later uh, learn that he was Shubho Moitro a clerk in the weights and measures department and a camp follower, meaning he is in the same ideological camp with, with these people. <clears throat> he was a bit younger, perhaps in his early 50s and held others in awe. The rest did not quite treat him as an equal and made fun of him behind his back. That is the casteism mysterious sociologist is talking about, okay? This is Bengal casteism. The rest did not quite treat him as an equal and made fun of him behind his back, sometimes even to his face. Shubho tolerated this without complaint because he, of course, had much respect for these people. Holly found that he attended all meetings religiously and read all articles, columns and poems written by the others in that group. Indeed, he seemed to live in order to be a part of the group. So he, sort, he has sort of fanboyism for the rest of the group here. So you are from America. Where in America? I'm with the University of New Haven. I both teach and conduct research there. I have been to America twice. Once in 1989 to present a paper on post-colonial linguistic resonance at the University of East Texas. And then in 1995 to attend a conference organized by my friend Savitri Biwak. This is, this is very, very insane trolling going on. First of all, there is a Gayatri Di. And now there is a Savitri Biwak. Let's read, read this paragraph once again. <clears throat> so again, a trolling for Gayatri Spivak. I have been to America twice, once in 1989 to present a paper on post-colonial linguistic resonance at the University of East Texas, and then in 1995 to attend a conference organized by, by, by my friend Savitri Biwak. <laughs> Do you know her? Holly says, I'm afraid not. The US is a big place. Uh, and then he, Biplop says, big houses, big cars, but no culture, no soul. Like people go on even today that Kolkata, everything, baki sab chodo. Kolkata has soul. Soul, the soul that makes you uh, join Trinamool Congress and become a gunda for them, that soul. So uh, then, then someone else says, I have never been to America, but I have been to Britain. Uh, I went with an, uh, with an MLA delegation to, uh, to attend a human rights workshop. I have been to uh, Dubai many times. So what brings you to Kolkata? I am doing some research on Indian intellectual life and was told to come here. An Indian colleague connected me to Biplob. This is Holly saying. Now... You have come to the right place. We are not money-minded like the Gujaratis and Marwaris. Even if Kolkata has fallen behind a little in economic terms, this is still the intellectual and cultural capital of India. 
what bengal thinks today india thinks tomorrow end quote in the course of the next hour and a half over now this is one of the most trolly paragraphs ever okay listen to this now okay <clears throat> In the course of the next half an hour, hour and a half, over more cups of tea, the conversation took many twists and turns. A detailed comparison of Obama's position in Afghanistan versus Nixon's position in Vietnam and the 19th century British experience with the Afghan wars. From a dissection of Trump's options in the Korean Peninsula to the emerging trends in Kolkata's student politics, it then turned to an animated discussion on the general deterioration in cinematic standards due to the commercial influence of Bollywood. There was a general consensus that black and white European art films of the 50s represented the pinnacle of lensmanship, meaning camera work. Although, of course, there was the genius of Ray. Kitna chi stroll kar diya ek paragraph me. I love this paragraph. I have read this story to so many of my friends. From a dissection of Trump's options in the Korean Peninsula to the emerging trends in Kolkata student politics, it then turned to an animated discussion on the general deterioration in cinematic standards due to the commercial influence of Bollywood. We, Bollywood nahi hota tab hum bade world class film bana lete, okay? There was a general consensus that black and white European art films of the 50s represented the pinnacle of lensmanship, although of course there was the genius of Ray. Furious debate raised on the relative abilities of erstwhile cricketing captains uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni, Saurav Ganguly, Lala Amarnath, Tiger Pataudi before it turned to the relative merits of the Latin American and European styles of playing football and whether or not Federer is really the greatest tennis player of all time. Statistics and counter statistics were thrown about. Holly was impressed by the learned discussion but would have been even more so if she had known that none of the participants had ever actually played cricket, tennis or football. Now, next quote from one of these intellectuals that All this T20 cricket is not really cricket. It is entertainment. It does not show the true art. Only money making. Totally agree. Don't know why there is such a fuss over Kohli. Wouldn't have lasted long against the West Indies bowling attack of the 1970s. Totally failed. I was in Eden all five days during the test of December 1978 when Gavaskar scored 107 before being caught by Bacchus of Philip in the first innings. He then went on to score 182 not out in the second. The crowds used to understand test cricket in those days, not like now. They just want a spectacle. You see, this is why I really have large disagreements in terms of uh, avoiding cliches. Even when I hear uh, baseless criticisms of America and capitalism, even from Hindutvadis, because you all don't know how much Bengali commie vibes you all give me. Shubho listened intently to the conversation and jotted down the significant observations in a small notebook. Shubho, okay? Shubho Moitro, the... The, the sort of the insignificant person. <clears throat> he occasionally ventured a comment but was mostly ignored. Even if he tried to make a comment, no one was listening to him. Holly stayed in Kolkata for several more weeks and met, met the group many times. They initially met at the coffee house but the American academic tired of the place and the oily snacks and, man, uh, and managed to convince the others to have their gatherings at bars and cafes in and around Park Street. Now here, there's a twist. They don't want to go to those elitist cafes, okay? Because those are capitalist things. The intellectuals were somewhat reluctant to shift on the principle that these places were elitist. Okay? Another twist. But they readily agreed when Holly made it clear that she would pay all the bills. Eventually, she invited them to Calcutta Club, a centrally located colonial era club that she would she could access through a reciprocal arrangement. And this is the Calcutta Club where the <laughs> debate between Jaisai Deepak and Anand Ranganathan happened. <laughs> it was while sipping Mokaibari tea in the Calcutta Club veranda that Holly told the others that her university was organizing a conference on the post-colonial literary theory and was um, and was inviting papers from leading experts. They would be very pleased to accept a submission from India. Shurujit Da is the obvious person to do this. Someone is saying, okay. He would have been head of department if the government had not changed. Are bhai? Shurujit Da would have been sports minister if the government had not changed. Shurujit Da would have been head of English literature department if the government had not had not changed. Imagine. Observe what Sanjeev Sanyal is insinuating here. And, and, and I'll tell you, the mysterious sociologist who has basically said these things, right? He has not read these books, okay? He does not have the time to read anything other than his sociology books. But... See how much Sanjeev Sanyal is corroborating what we were saying. <clears throat> Dr. Shurajit Haldar, Haldar smiled nonchalantly. He said, I am very busy these days, but I will see what I can do to help you with this. That would be, now Holly is saying, that would be wonderful. 
we will pay for all travel expenses of course and make arrangements for your stay in new haven for the duration of the conference the only hitch is that the submission date is just two months away i had submitted a paper to professor daniel nelson of harvard in 1997 for his quarterly journal journal he had replied to me that they would get back after carefully examining the paper i will show you the letter but they have still not got back probably the fellow is still trying to understand the section where i had validated my thesis on derrida <laughs> anyway i will not wait for harvard any longer and will send you an updated version holly says please send it to us and i'm sure the conference organizers would love to hear you speak about it i also want to uh, submit a paper everyone turned to look at shubho this was possibly the first time ever that he was enjoying the full attention of the group out of the blue the insignificant shubho moitro ends up saying i also want to submit a paper after a short silence shubhajit smiled patronizingly okay that shubhajit haldar yes shubho you must holly returned to new haven a few weeks a few days later seven weeks seven weeks later she received two papers in her inbox one a formal deconstruction of tagore's narratives within an al- alter deridian epistemological darstelung by dr shubhajit haldar and a multi step te- teleological examination of subaltern literary heuristics in post colonial bengal by shubhajit moitro a couple of weeks later the office of professor holly cat sent out an airline ticket and a formal invita- invitation letter to mr shubhajit moitro requesting him to present his paper at the university of new haven a separate la- letter was sent to dr haldar thanking him for his submission and assuring him that the paper would be given due consideration for future events to <clears throat> पहला ट्विस्ट यहाँ पे आ गया कि शुभोजित हालदार जो कि रेस्पेक्टेड था ग्रुप में उसका पेपर रिजेक्ट हो गया बहुत बड़ी बहुत बुरी बात है लेट्स सी व्हाट हैपेंस नाउ हॉली पर्सनली ड्रोव डाउन टू न्यूयॉर्क एयरपोर्ट टू पिक अप शुभो एंड मेड श्योर ही हैड अ कंफर्टेबल रूम एट द विजिटिंग फैकल्टी ब्लॉक द कॉन्फ्रेंस वॉज नॉट अ लार्ज अफेयर अराउंड थर्टी फाइव स्टूडेंट्स एंड अ हैंडफुल ऑफ फैकल्टी मेंबर्स टू डॉक्टर ऑल कैंडिडेट्स प्रेजेंटेड देयर पेपर्स फॉलोड बाई शुभो ही वोर हिज बेस्ट सूट एंड अ बॉरोड येलो टाई द ऑडियंस आस्ट अ फ्यू पोलाइट क्वेश्चन एंड इट वॉज ओवर Holly made sure he took several photographs of Shubho as he spoke and later a group photograph together with the audience. The following day, Holly drove him back to the airport. On the way, she made a detour to show him Manhattan. Shubho was very pleased and thanked the professor profusely. The chapter ends. A new subchapter says, this is the last chapter la, la, basically last subchapter of the book. A few months later, a yellow ambassador taxi rattled to a halt by the side of the crowded street. The taxi driver quoted an inflated fare but Holly landed him handed him the correct amount and got off before the driver could argue. One of the bookstall owners gave her a nod of recognition as she confidently made her way to the coffee house so she is basically back at College Street Kolkata. She found her group of intellectuals in deep discussion at their usual table. The same people were were there but their seating arrangement had changed. Shubho now sat on the colonial era wooden chair directly under the portrait of the great poet. the others were listening intently as he made a strong case for the regulation of soap advertising okay now the discussion is about how to regulate soap advertising because there are topless models kind of being shown but uh, it might have some bad influences in the society those sorts of things when he looked up and uh, saw holly make her way across the hall he gave her a benevolent smile no more than a year had passed when the following article appeared in the quarterly journal of social anthropology now listen to what article was written by holly <clears throat> a study of intellectual hierarchies in stagnation listen to this this is of course basically shonjeep channel writing this right what is his topic a study of intellectual hierarchies in stagnation how do hierarchies of of academia occur when there is a stagnation in society that is the topic author professor holly cats university of new haven The author would like to thank the John and Sally Depp Foundation for their generous funding of this project. She is also grateful to the faculty and students of the School of Social Anthropology for organizing the mock conference that was critical for the study. Now, he has a big twist, big twist in the story. The conference was a mock conference, probably the one where Shubha Moitra went to. Okay. Now listen to the abstract of the paper by Holly Katz. This is a study of group dynamics in the context of intellectual stagnation. Given the overall context of ta- stagnation, the hierarchy within the group can retain can remain frozen for very long periods of time. However, in a controlled experiment, we found that group dynamics can still be manipulated through external stimulus. This is possible because the incumbent hierarchy is itself 
based on claims of external validation since prolonged stagnation precludes internal validation listen to this insane sentence once again okay holly katz is saying she has found out in her research that uh, <clears throat> in a in a stagnated situation given the overall context of stagnation the hierarchy within the group can remain also stagnated but that that stagnation can change when some external stimulus is added like what holly did to this group a fake conference okay now why is that why is the fake conference being able to alter the hierarchy inside the uh, inside the stagnated academic hierarchy because the the validation for that uh, academic group came from external objects anyway okay they were saying that even americans know her that is the point here so this is possible because the incumbent hierarchy is itself based on claims of external validation ke bahar ke university se mera degree hai ki nahi ya fir things like that that do i have a degree from college street kolkata presidency college or not <clears throat> claims of external validation since prolonged stagnation precludes internal validation thus changing the relative claims of external validation so when you change the uh the, the the metrics of the external validation you you take shubha moitra away to usa for a conference that can radically overturn the hierarchy of such a group of intellectuals the paper contains the full record of exp of the experiment conducted over 2017 to 2018 but the names of uh, mentioned individuals have been deliberately changed in order to protect their identities what a phenomenal story it's 9:30 already otherwise i would have gotten to the story about delhi intellectuals also maybe some day maybe after the live stream i'm planning uh, at 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 midnight if there is no power cut okay who what a story uh okay then thank you for joining the live stream guys let's see if any important comment has come up we barely have any intellectuals and we despise gandhi you can master your mother tongue yeah uh, honestly english is added advantage especially in higher education English is a convenience it's not necessary lack of english does not hold us back it's not even a weakness we think it is is there a bengali kshatriya jati they they can become martial race well uh, the bose surname is is the kshatriya but they come inside the uh, kayostho class subhashchandra bose was a kshatriya it gets him people to invite uh, him to talk in japanese that's true greatness bhai boita naam ki uh, life over two beers okay guys thanks a lot for joining we are coming back in at midnight Thank you bye bye